Thank you very much uh, for having us. This has been a gr uh, great experience. Um, we, I'm Joe Pimentel, this is Matt Miles, and uh, we both graduated from JMU, different years, and um, we're thrilled to be back in the Valley. Um, this is a, this feels like home. Um, we are going to be talking today, this is a, a Boca Road Screen School, and um, we're going to be talking about how that came out and came to be. We have to say at the outset that we, we have to issue the disclaimer that we're not speaking on behalf of our employer, um, who's annoyed <laughs> with us already. <laughs> um, and um, speaking of being employees, uh, we're just finding it amusing that uh, we're now here doing the uh, staff development that you know, you don't have anything else you can be doing right now, right? <laughs> right papers or anything. We're both uh, high school teachers um, in Northern Virginia. So we're sorry. Is there anything? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get that out the open right now. Um, so thanks very much, like I said, for, for being here and indulging us. This uh, issue is obviously not going to go away, the, how the technology is used um, and, and what our kids are doing with it and what we're doing with it in the classroom. Um, that we're kind of right at the beginning of of what's happening. And, and this all came about um, a few years ago. Matt and I started to, to notice, this is my 25th year in the classroom, and Matt, not 25 years. And we both noticed over the last uh, several years, that things were changing in the classroom. If you've been around a while, maybe you've seen similar things, that we noticed that students were having trouble, more trouble, with things that they used to not have so much trouble with. Um, focusing for long periods of time, critical thought, uh, problem solving, social interaction, and we, we would talk at lunch, we teach at the same school, we would talk at lunch and say, What's, you know, what is going on? This is maybe five, six years ago. We both started to read, and, you know, and we both, by the way, we should also say at the outset, we both come to this with, uh, with IT backgrounds. Um, I was a Unix system administrator before I was a teacher, and um, Matt was in? Uh, when I started at JMU, I was IT, then media, arts, and design. That lasted about three months, and then I was uh, business, but then I was teaching. But, and, but yeah, so the first two years was all technology. Yeah, and, and Matt, ironically enough, is our tech representative from each department in our school as a tech representative. It's, it's Matt. Um, <laughs> and I have, a, I have a home business that runs on it's a data processing business. So we're both very comfortable with technology. We're not coming at this with a, we, we didn't come into this with any sort of axe to grind and say, well, ah, technology's terrible. It was the fact that we both started reading independently and saying, what is going on? What's causing all this? And we started to read and read and read. And every time we read something, there was there was a there was an element of screen time, the overuse of screen time in there. And so we said, well, what's that doing in the classroom? And what's what's the implication for what we should be doing in classrooms? And um, we said, well, let's read that. And we looked around and there wasn't anything. So we said, well, then let's write something. And we initially thought well, we'll write, uh, you know, we'll see what we can find and write maybe a, a, a blog piece or two or something, write an op-ed. And uh, over time, it just it took on a life of its own. So we started to interview people from initially just locally, in, you know, in, in school and in other schools that we do. And then, you know, because of the wonders of technology, we ended up interviewing people, teachers from all over the world, neuroscientists, psychiatrists, family therapists, and just talking about what is happening to kids. And, um, like I said, there's a lot out there on what's happening to the brain and to the, and, and the screen overuse and so on, but not very much at all about how that impacts what's happening in schools. And so what we're going to say today is not I think or I believe, but this is our impression. What we're going to be talking about are things that we've seen and then things that we've read and, and studies that have been done. So we're going to be talking about what is, the things that we know are, are going on. And um, I don't know if, you, if I missed anything in the introduction. That's pretty comprehensive. Okay, thank That's you. a long time. So, <laughs> so here's the first question we want to start with. Um, these can be, and the answer to this question can be things that you actually believe, or it can be things that you've been told, or impressions you've gotten from watching commercials or or ads you've seen online or whatever. But why is it? Why does screen-based technology belong in schools? Yeah, Joe. When and just to tag on that real quick, Joe. When Joe and I are one hand are researching or not. Re like reading the research on all the negative side effects of overusing screen. Meanwhile, we'd go to in services, but we'd sit, we sat in a, a meeting just like this on how to use Twitter in the classroom. Uh, everything was pro tech, 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 but how can we get more tech in? And there was a huge, um, you know, 
difference between what we knew to be true and what we're being told. But we heard this so much, and I don't know if you guys have it, you know, in a similar way in this county, but um, we were so inundated, we could tell you the script. So um, we're wondering if, if, do you know the script? Like, have you, what, what would you say? How would you answer that question? Why, why should we be using screens in school? Away. Not going away, it's 21st century skills. Good. Anybody else? There's potential for like computer assisted design and individualized learning of content. Individualized learning. Okay. Good. Instant feedback. Instant feedback, sure. In a way that a teacher can't provide and take a quick quiz. I got six out of ten or whatever. Okay, good. Anybody else? Differentiation. Differentiation kind of go along with the personalized learning bit that you know this person can work on this while well, that person works on that and this is a skill that I need help on and that's a skill that they can work at their own pace too. That's a big thing. It's very much related to that. Some kids learn faster than others, so this allows <laughs> kids to to explore at their own pace is a big thing. High growth careers tend to be um, we're told technology based robotics, automation, programming. Okay. Got to prepare kids for the workforce. Cyber security, yeah. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Kids are already digital natives, so speaking their language. Kids are digital natives. Yeah, they, they would say meet kids where they are. That's what the phrase is. Yeah, that's where they are. They live in a digital world, so we got to we got to get into that digital world, right? Pure communication, uh, knowing what grades you have or what's missing. Of instant access to mm -hmm. sure, yeah. In our system, we've got the I don't know if you all have that. We've got a, all the grades are digital, so the parents can log in and see grades, and kids, you know, everybody can see everything in real time. I think some of it is optics. It's seen as if a school or a district or a county can afford to provide this, it's perceived as the cutting edge kind of growth side of education. Oh, that school must be doing on the up and coming or must be doing the it thing. Right, right. And not only that, but if the school next door is doing it and you're not, what does that tell the parents in the community? Right. The, the, just go to the optics. Yes, yeah, just the optics of it, right. right. The, the optics are, well, we're lagging behind and they're, they're searching ahead, right? Yeah, why, why would they invest in their kids and you're unwilling to invest? Yeah, you must hate kids. Okay, so so we've heard these two. Um, you hear the, we hear this. Education hasn't changed since the Industrial Revolution. Um, that's a, that's a, that usually is the premise for the whole argument that things things need to change. We haven't changed since the Industrial Revolution. Yeah, this is normally the opening scene of an ed tech commercial or documentary, and they'll show like a 1950s classroom with all the rows and the kids with the nice hair and the apple on the desk and their hands up. Which, first of all, I don't know anybody's classroom. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, never I've never had an apple. Over there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we need to teach twenty first century skills. We heard that, right? That's the that's the key. I mean, kids are this is the this is the world they live in, right? Um, kids are doing wonderful things when they're on technology. They're digital natives. We're poor, dumb digital immigrants. And so they're doing all this great stuff, and they can show us all these great things that they're doing. Right? Um, and I don't know, we didn't touch on this, but schools are re uh, screens will reduce the achievement gap. It's a, if there's an access gap, you hear that phrase used a lot, that uh, poor families don't have computers, they don't have internet access, and by providing those to kids and providing them for everybody in the same way, we can, we can reduce the achievement gap. Well, and that speaks to the optics, right? Like the, the big push now is to get them into low income schools. You know, you see people like Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates investing billions of dollars to get as many laptops into these lower achieving schools, these lower socioeconomic schools. Um, and that all has to do with that, the optics of it. It's the state purposes, the achievement gap, we reduce that. Um, well, what we found is those are, those are all, in, in reality, those are all myths. Um, and, uh, Education hasn't changed since the Industrial Revolution. Yeah, it has. Right? I mean, especially if you've been doing this for more than six months, you've seen the change in some way, right? And I went to school, uh, my school was, uh, my high school, it was seven through 12, it was an open school. I don't know if anybody remembers an open school or what that model is. Uh, it was a school with no walls inside. No walls. That's it, that's the, that's the open school. 
Because you can't cage learning, man. <laughs> <laughs> that was, it was the 70s, and people developed the, this idea that, hey, man, yeah, kids should be able to just kind of float from one area to another. So there would be a big open area like this. There would be an English class over here. Kids kind of sitting around, you know, cross-legged on the floor. And then over there, there would be a math class. And over there, there would be a history class and whatever. And that was, that, I'm not kidding. That's the way my high school operated. It was as terrible as an idea as it sounds like. I can't believe that I can act. Um, and, 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 and it went on, it was like I said, it was 7 through 12. And what was interesting to me was it was a fairly new school when I was in seventh grade. And by the time I was a senior, the walls weren't all up, but they had moved in semi-permanent dividers <laughs> like around the little area because they realized, hmm, this might not be such a hot idea. <laughs> and, and, and so, the, yes, of course, and that was going to be, by the way, the thing. The school where I went, like I said, was the was an open school model. The school where we now teach was originally an open school. And it was such a bad idea that came in and put walls in the school where we teach. There are no windows. None in the whole school because it's like a prison. <laughs> yeah, it's very much prison life. The, the even the, on the outside, there are some windows on the outside because it was these huge open expanses. So if you just had a few windows here and there, that was enough to let natural light in. Well, as soon as you come inside and you build halls and walls, everything on the interior has no uh, windows. So it, that's how bad it was. That we said, well, we can have windows or we can have this ridiculous system. Let's go with no windows and have a, a reasonable classroom setting. Um, so education changes, and then we go, oh, well, maybe that wasn't such a hot idea, and then we go on to, to something else. Um, smoking courts are similar to the high school that I went to. The smoking age was 16 when I was in high school, and we had a smoking court for students to go smoke. During the school day, couldn't, you know, couldn't go the day without a smoke break, so you go out, there was a little area there that was paid for with taxpayer money, right? It was a school employee was cleaning up the butts on the ground or whatever. Uh, taxpayer money actually went to help students smoke during the school day. And the idea was, see if this sounds familiar, we gotta meet kids where they are, <laughs> right? We know they like to smoke. We're tired of them going to the bathrooms to smoke. So let's give them a place to smoke. We will designate this is the place where you can go smoke. Nobody's gonna hassle you, just go there and smoke. Don't go to the bathroom to smoke, right? And a lot of people looked at that and said, well, like, all right, I mean, you know, we'd rather they didn't smoke, but if they're going to, let's make it as good as it can be. <laughs> it's preposterous on its face, but we did it. And it's and similarly, we say, well, kids are using uh, their phones and computers and laptops and tablets for nine hours a day outside of school. So that's what they like. So let's do more of that in school. The, the argument kind of falls on its face if you, if you really think about it. And, and we'll go even further with this idea that education hasn't changed. Yeah, I mean, I would say that superficially there have been changes. Um, every couple of months, there's the new thing that's going to fix education in this country. But as a whole, as a core, and not only has education not changed since the Industrial Revolution, it pretty much hasn't changed since our, our entire existence as a species. Learning is what sets us apart. It's why we could compete with lions and bears and things like that. It's why we're so successful as a species. Is because we can learn. You think because you invented an iPad 10 years ago, we learn differently now? Like that's revolutionized our brains? Like that is so absurd and arrogant. I don't know. I don't get it. Could it be that in the last 100,000 years, we figured out something that works? Could it be that, that there's a method in which we learn and that we discovered that so we could survive as a species? I don't know. I'm pretty confident that uh, smartphones haven't changed that, the way our brains work. Right. Um, this is a picture of, a, of what's called a Socratic seminar, right? And it's, it's kind of held up as a, as a pretty, pretty successful model in a classroom to get a discussion going and to help kids birth new ideas and arrive at some, some, some truths. Um, a Socratic seminar. <laughs> Socrates, right? <laughs> it's thousands of years ago that, that education has been uh, in the hands of some pretty capable people, and, and we as a profession have done a pretty good job of carrying on the tradition. And there are things in education that work. 
And can you add new things in that when we figure out something that's really great? Of course, we would be silly to not do that. But it, it, it doesn't have to be one thing all the time, every time. And nothing is, nothing is going to be like that. Um, the second one we like to address is that you have to, right? Like, th there's a reason why our school system in Fairfax County, it, or I shouldn't say that, the school system in which we work, uh, <laughs> which said, is great and we love, love very, it. very, very, great. We're very thankful. Great place to work. We're employed. Love you for 25 years. But, love you. That's <laughs> done. <laughs> they, there's a reason that they invested, you know, I don't know, a billion dollars in buying iPads K through 12, right? Or we have to secondary as Chromebooks, but what? Think about that. 21st century skills. Our kids, our children, our kindergartners need iPads so that they can function in the 21st century, so that they'll have jobs that will be able to function, you know, with all the technology. What? Technology, you think, is going to be around 18 years from now. You know, you think that when they graduate from college, that they're going to, on their resume, put, I know how to use an iPad 6, right? Like, that's so, it, it, it's not the kind of skills that are actually out there. Right. And um, we get that reference to the Twitter presentation we went to. And the Twitter presentation we went to had a slide that said, it was a picture of a VHS tape. And it said, if you're not using Twitter in the classroom, you're as useless as this VHS tape. And which I took great offense to. I enjoy VHS tapes. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but the, you know, again, the idea that, that one tool or one app or one technique is going to solve your education problems is, is of course, uh, falling. Twitter, I don't know if it has a, a place in the classroom, but that's not a 21st century skill. All of these things, Twitter, uh, Minecraft, Facebook, you know, all these things that you hear about as, as, as ways to use, you know, to integrate technology in the classroom, they're all so easy to use, you don't have to teach them. Like, they're, they're on purpose made to be really, really simple to use. They wouldn't be bought a lot, they wouldn't be used a lot if they were really difficult to use. Nobody's, that I know anyway, is, 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 runs their computer with C prompt, you know, the C and colon or the, the little greater than sign, and then you have to type in commands or whatever. Dots, Dots then. <laughs> uh, then. We don't do that because it's, it's we, you know, going over Windows, it's much easier. So we want things to be as easy as possible. And so the idea that we're going to teach kids something super valuable, like teaching them how to use Twitter or, or whatever. I mean, do kids need to know how to establish an online profile responsibly? Of course. But that doesn't mean that if I'm teaching about George Washington, I need to use Facebook. Um, these are the skills that uh, Forbes magazine says uh, millennials need in, in the 21st century. Yeah, so, so leadership, number one, communication, number two, focus and attention, number three, wide knowledge base, four, and humility, five. These are what companies are looking for. And even if you go to the Silicon Valley where they're looking for programmers, the first thing they want to know, they, the, the, what they want to see is the, what, what is the new... The soft skills? Soft skills. Yeah, what is the number one thing they look for? I don't know where you're going with this. <laughs> <laughs> they need to know that programming language, like Dragon or, or I don't know what's called. Oh, Dragon. Is yeah, that it? I think so. All right, so they need to know how to program. Your, your programmers need to know how to program. The number two thing they need to do is communicate, right? They're not interested. Everything else are these soft skills, these interpersonal skills. These are skills that involve social interactions. And if you have a purely digital existence, we would argue that it's not only harder in many ways to teach these skills, in some ways they, the technology works against many of these skills. So our focus as teachers should be to how do you reach, and we're not saying you should go back to what we used to do in the 90s, the 80s, or the 60s, or whatever. Um, <laughs> like you pointed, pointed to me. <laughs> Um, what we're saying is that how, how can you, you, you have children come in your class who spend on average nine and a half hours a day on screens and then you have them come into your class. How is it, how do you convey these skills to them? Because a lot of kids, the average kid is not getting these skills at home. So how is it you get these skills worked into your classroom? And I think the idea of, well, let's get it through more technology. I think that can in many ways be counterproductive. And, and if you look a lot at the, uh, the, the, the super wealthy, 
and how they're dealing with their own kids. Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs famously was asked how his kids like the iPad, and he said, I don't know, we don't get into them. Um, right, I mean, the guy who invented it said, well, this could be kind of dangerous for my kids, I'm not gonna do that. Steve Jobs, uh, Bill Gates had a 45 minute a day screen time limit in his house. And where do those people send their kids to school? The, the, one of the most uh, popular places where tech executives send their kids is called the Waldorf Schools, and there's a movement nationwide. Uh, they're tech-free uh, all day long, and, and some of them are so tech-free that the, the family has to sign a contract saying, even at home, we won't have a TV, we won't have whatever. And these are schools where, you know, for K through 12, you're spending $50,000 a year to send. But these are the, the, the super wealthy seem to have this idea that maybe maybe this isn't, uh, you know, it's, it isn't super necessary to have all these, uh, have, the, have the technology in school. And that, that's not, because Bill Gates didn't do it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it either. Any more than it means because he does it, we should do it too. It just means they're not necessarily related. Um, the third myth is that uh, kids are doing wonderful things when they're on their technology. Um, I think this video, I think the audio will work. Um, this was from a uh, professional development we went to on the need for a smartphone, for using smartphones in, uh, in school. I know, the sight of me on the device in class makes some of you nervous, but I'm not posting selfies to Instagram right now. I'm actually in a Google Hangout typing questions to a researcher in Botswana about water conservation. It's part of a project I'm working on. My friend Emma just found a blog from the Chesapeake Bay Foundation with some awesome info as well. See, technology provides great opportunities for us. It's a part of our lives. My teacher is making sure I know how to use it safely and responsibly. And that's why you've come here today. Okay. Oops. Um, okay, so. That was the that was the premise. Um, That's great, right? Can, I mean, can those things be done with technology in the classroom? Of course, of course, of course, kids can can connect with people all over the world, and they can read research by by the most impressive scientists on the planet. Absolutely, they can get, they get into Google Hangout with with people uh, you know from all over the planet, and that's that is great. That, is, that, is, that can be transformative, but. Is that what's really going on? Have you ever caught your kids on their phones talking to a researcher from Botswana? Right? Is that a realistic expectation? Like, You're laughing. You know how absurd that is. You know who thinks it's funny also? Our students think it's funny. Yeah. Right? I showed that to them. And my student said, if you see me on my cell phone, you see me on my cell phone, there's a 0% chance I'm doing something productive. If I'm on my laptop, it's much higher. It's about 50%. Um, so, the, and all of that gets to, and, and why we're saying, you know, we're kind of poo-pooing the, the, these transformative things that get sold. It's packaged, well, they can do this, and you can do this with technology. One of the reasons we poo-poo it is because kids can't, right? It's unrealistic to expect them to realize this potential. What kid is going to go into a Google? First of all, my kids pointed out if you're a, like a, a 16 year old girl in a Google Hangout, so it's like you're talking about water. I'm a we're Botswana man. That's who I am. A water researcher from Botswana. Probably not who he says he is, right? First of all, <laughs> and then the the second issue would be they they physically can't realize it, right? Because the draw of all the other things on their laptop, the, the, the reason why the phone and the laptop today are so great is because they're so dynamic. Um, it can do all of those things. But what is more engaging, water conservation or their friends or on social media, the tap behind it, or um, you know all the different types of apps, the gaming apps, kids are experts at Alt-Tab, right? As soon as you walk by as a teacher, Alt-Tab, you see the kids do it, just the Alt-Tab switches the screen, right? They'll have their, their social media app up, and as soon as you stand up, and it's right back to what they're looking at, and they look like they're doing great thing. Wow, that's great. Why are you still in question number two, 45 minutes in? <laughs> really working on it, bro. Um, so what we know is that the, the, all the incredible things that could be done, I mean, fire, uh, fire does great things, for us, it's good that we have fire. Um, we don't give it to kids to play with, right? And so we have to be very careful about how we introduce any sort of digital screen-based technology because of the of the tremendous opportunity for lost 
time, we lost chances to connect with other human beings. And so we, um, we encourage people to think very hard about using technology in some sort of purposeful, intentional way. The idea that because kids are digital immigrants, or sorry, they're digital natives, um, that they're just automatically going to be able to find all these really good things about technology and ways to do it. That, that, that's putting a lot on the kid. Um, wouldn't have an Alcoholics Anonymous, Anonymous meeting in a bar um, for obvious reasons. And I think saying, we're gonna, I'm gonna put your learning online, I'm gonna put your learning on your phone, I'm gonna put your learning on your laptop or your tablet is, is akin to that, right? It's, 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 it's setting up a kid for failure. We're going to put you here in this place where we know that you're gonna have trouble because you're you're 13 and your prefrontal cortex isn't fully cooked and you probably aren't gonna be able to resist the pull of the Netflix and the and the whatever else it is you're looking at, video games and everything else. Um, so it's it's purposeful and intentional use that we really have to focus on. Um, it, 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 these are just some statistics about how how long kids are doing things that are. The, the, the good stuff that we want kids to be doing. Only about 3% of their time is, is on the content creation, which is the, you know, the real creative outlet on a device. Um, this is one that's staggering. Um, let that marinate for a minute. Um, and and, and we, we put teenage boys up there, and that's the, that's the number. Um, that's an old number, a few years. Um, but for good, they, the, you know, the, one of the many distressing things about that is that it doesn't end there. It's girls as well. Girls are uh, roped in. So that obviously can, we wrote a lot of section in the book about the, the damage that does to, to kids um, mentally and, 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 and when it comes to their relationships that they have later in life. Um, and so, you know, this, this kind of, Bill Selwyn kind of sums it all up. The findings show that young people's engagements with digital technology varied and often unspectacular in stark contrast to popular portrayals of the digital natives. The, the scientists who study this would probably laugh at the notion that we hear from, from ed tech companies, educational technology companies, that kids are going to do all these great things that when they really look at what's actually happening, it's not so, not so spectacular. I mean, if you just think about it logically and put yourself back into a 13-year-old's body, especially if you're a 13-year-old boy, give them a textbook but staple in the front of it a Playboy and then say, hey, go up to your bedroom and do your homework. And you wouldn't be surprised it was taking them four or five hours to do their homework, right? It would be amazing that they ever got started. Um, myth number four, students need to be in charge of their own learning. And this is getting back to that differentiation point. Um, kids learn differently and, and kids like different things and they work at their own pace. And we all know that at some level that's true. Um, these are some of the terminology that we hear all the time. Personalized student-centered learning. Um, this is what this allowed by giving kids the laptops. They're now in charge of their own learning. That sounds wonderful. Um, teachers are to be guides on the sides. They're supposed to, we were actually told not to interact with our students. Put your desk, we, you know, we had to do professional development where we watched other teachers teach. And one of the things we we're instructed to look for is look for teachers being guides on the sides, as in, Look for teachers not teaching, right? Be off. Let the kids be in charge of their own learning. And then the last one is the flipped classroom. That's where the kids, you put the content instruction online and the kids teach themselves. And when they come into class, you're just there to help them do the homework. Um, so these are the big ideas behind computer-based learning. What we're arguing for is not student, we, we believe in student-centered learning. Right? None of us got in this profession for our, us, right? We didn't become for you. To get rich. We're somehow <laughs> like, you don't come into school to promote yourself, right? We're all here for students, right? What we're saying is expert led. You wouldn't put your child in charge of their own diet, would you? <laughs> student centered diets, right? And be like, well, they just like Twinkies. Right? Like, that's how they learn. That's how they keep they eat Twinkies. Right? You wouldn't do that. You know, as an adult, that they should be eating broccoli and their vegetables or whatever. Right? They should have a well-balanced diet because you're an adult and they are a child. You're not going... If, if you put me in charge of my learning at age six, I would be a taxi cab driver because at age six, that's what I really, really wanted to do. Um, and thank God... An adult showed me 
what I should learn, right? And and the idea here again is the expert led. Education is a really weird field in that very often we will listen to people who aren't experts. Like Bill Gates, people look to Bill Gates to get information about teaching and about, about how to design a school and about how to design education and lesson plans and so on. He's, I'm sure he's a really bright guy. I and mean, he's obviously you know, done pretty well for himself, I hear. But I, he's not, his area of expert, this is not it for him. This, he's not an expert in education. He just came out with a, with a plan for nuclear energy. That we need to be using more nuclear energy. We're going to take a position on nuclear energy one way or the other. But nuclear physicists shot him down and laughed it off and said, look, first of all, you're not a nuclear physicist. You might be a really bright guy, but stay in your lane, Bill. Um, <laughs> in education, though, we go, oh. Bill Gates said we should do this, so I guess we should. And Mark Zuckerberg and, and the same thing. Expert, we're the experts, right? And all the, the people who have devoted their lives to doing this know what kids need and know how to help kids. Um, and that's, to us, that's student-centered learning. That's putting the kid at the center and saying, how, how can I best help these kids? And if the way you can best help a kid involves a screen at some point, great. But that doesn't mean that everybody needs to have a screen all day long. And then, and then fundamentally, this whole notion is built on what they call the learning styles myth. It, it's never, not only, not only has it never been substantiated by any research that we actually learn differently, it's actually been shown that there's been studies done that if you take your most preferred learning styles, like, oh, I'm a visual learner, and you do something visual, they actually learn the least from that because it's not difficult for them. Learning happens when something's cognitively challenging and it's difficult. So doing something the kid wants is actually counterproductive. You should force them to do things they don't want to do. What is your learning style, right? Do you like auditory? Here's visual, right? That's how you should, what is your least favorite? Um, you should have a choice in that whatever they pick, you do the opposite, right? That, that's actually how you're going to retain knowledge. So again, you shouldn't let kids drive the car of the most important thing in their lives, their, their education, or one of the most important things. Um, okay, that's what Matt just said. And, you know, the idea of we both teach government, and if, if you teach any, any humanities, or really any class, if you're going to do any sort of debate or discussion, just to go off of Matt's last point, if, if it, kids will tell you that they learned a, a lot when you, if you force them to argue a point that they don't actually believe. How many of you are Republicans? Okay, raise your hand. All right, well, you're going to be Democrats for this activity. And how many, you know, all the rest of you said you're Democrats, you're going to be Republicans. And at the end of a situation like that, they'll tell you, oh man, you know what, it was really interesting to think about it from the other side or whatever. Do the thing that was, I was uncomfortable with. Um, and that's, what we're talking about here with this learning styles notion that, that we all need to be able to kind of use the whole, the all modalities. Um, so there you go. And then a, a final, I think this is the final myth that we're going to talk about. Sure. The, uh, the achievement gap. Um, you hear this one a lot, and the, like I said, the access gap, and, and that we can, we can close that achievement gap if we uh, make sure everybody's got a computer and they're, you know, they're learning online. So you, we should be looking for studies, what has science said? And so um, Jacob Vigdor at Duke did this study uh, a few years ago, and they took uh, households of lower income, low performing students, and introduced computers and internet access. In an effort, the, the point of the program was to, to close the achievement gap, to, to, to uh, to shrink it so that, you know, in, in particularly math and science, or sorry, math and, uh, and, and reading, the test scores would get closer to their wealthier, uh, more academically successful peers. But what they found is that the introduction of the home computer is associated with modest but statistically significant and persistent negative impacts on student math and reading test scores. And what they find is that kids in, in uh, lower income situations uh, often are unsupervised for great periods of the day. And so if you give a kid a computer, and the internet, they're not supervised. That's not purposeful, intentional uses, using of technology. That's, here's a computer, let it babysit you, and, and, and you're going to allow a 15-year-old with the uncooked brain to, they're going to figure out some stuff to do that might not be as, as productive as we want it to be. Um, so they found that this actually did, did more to um, why the achievement gap rather than less. Evidence suggests that providing universal access to own computers and high-speed internet <coughs> broaden rather than narrow the, uh, 
the gaps. And there was a, you can look that up. We have a, we have some of these studies linked on our website, screenschool.com, if you were um, so interested. It's kind of, we understand the irony of having a website to, to, <laughs> to talk about this. Or you could go to our blog or our Facebook page. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could really Facebook page. Um, but just kind of, you know, the last thing we'll do before we kind of turn over, but um, one of the things that they found was most successful at decreasing the achievement gap is there's a study done by Harvard um, where they took lower socioeconomic students and their teachers and they gave them a survey, just random stuff. Who's your favorite football team? You know, what's your favorite song? What's your favorite food? And they, they would, the teacher would fill it out and the students would fill it out. And what they do is at the end, they'd sit down with the teacher and the student and they say, do you guys know that you both share a love of the Redskins or something like that? We love the Redskins. But, um, and that closeness, the students started performing better and the, the teacher was more attentive. It, it, it showed that a closer <laughs> relationship between the teacher and the student created the most significant decrease of the achievement gap of any study done. So what that just illustrates is the importance of an ever-present teacher in the lives of our students. Um, you know, if, if you look at the, the learning model, if you just want to hit the next slide, this is, this is what the classroom we're told is the best classroom of the future. This is how to have student achievement. This, she's being a wonderful guide on the side. These kids are personalizing their own learning. They're moving at their own pace. All right, but this is not... <laughs> this is not what is known to be effective. You probably know that. You, know, you need to be present in your students' lives, talking to them, interacting with them. This is this is this is not good for kids and young people. Right. It's a, I mean, you know, this is a human enterprise, teaching, and you're more engaged. They're more engaged. If you feel like you both got skin in the game, and I I care about you, you care about me. That's going to matter, and you're just going to naturally want to do better. Um, and we'll wrap it up with with this, and that's a psychology teacher, so I'll let him explain the Harry Harlow stuff. But if you're familiar with Harry, I, you know, I love him as a psychologist, a pretty sick guy, but he took monkeys, a social primate, and he isolated them and essentially tortured them. Uh, and what he found was not surprising if you isolate monkeys and keep them uh, isolated for a long period of time, they had profound psychological distress, and they developed violent tendencies, overly anxious, depression, things like that. If you keep them isolated from other animals, they become depressed. And what we found is that we need close interactions. Another thing he did was he had a wire mom and a cloth mom. The wire mom had the food and the cloth mom just was cuddling. Which one did the monkeys like? The ones that would give them the information they need in this parallel, the thing that they need, or the one that was more engaging, more warm, more appreciative, and the monkeys overwhelmingly preferred the cloth mom, to the point where they would lead over and, and, and feed off the bottle, never letting go of the wire mom. So we've known since the 60s, in fact, you couldn't do Harry Harlow studies today. People demonize him as torturing monkeys, and he probably did, right? He's, he's considered one of the most unethical psychologists to ever come through, because what he did, he isolated kids. We saw this UPenn study. Uh, there was a University of Pennsylvania study where the Researcher said uh, she took college students at UPenn, average students there, which are probably pretty successful students. And she said, we're going to take a control group and, and we just ask them how much social media they use and divide the group in half. Half of you uh, are going to be the control group, half of you are going to be the study group. All of you take a psychological health profile. So they took it all at the beginning and they got some psychological health score. The control group continued to use their normal amount of social media. The study group reduced their social media use to 45 minutes a day because they were all way over 45 minutes a day. So they reduced it to 45 minutes a day. And they did that for, I think, three weeks or a month. And at the end, they all took the psychological health profile again. And perhaps not surprisingly, the students who uh, reduced their social media use got a much higher psychological health score and they were, you know, they said, well, you know, that really has an impact on me and I think I'm going to start using social media less and so on. Now, first of all, that's interesting to me in and of itself. But we read it and said, well, you know, what would be kind of interesting is could you, could you prove the other thing? Could you keep the control group the same, keep using social media, but increase, the other group, increase your social media use and see if they get sadder or if they get a, a less healthy psychological profile. 
So we reached out um, to uh, Melissa Hunt, who did the study, and she replied that the, she gave us permission to use this in a presentation. She said it would be unethical to do that study because we already have considerable correlation research making more work, more use to worse outcomes, knowing that her caps, we wouldn't want to cause harm. You couldn't do the study to tell them to use more social media. We didn't pass an ethics board. An ethics board would shoot it down immediately. But we're told if you're not using Twitter in the classroom, you're as useless as a VHS tape. You've got to get kids on Facebook. You've got to meet kids where they are. Uh, and it, you have to make them use more social media. You could not study it. And she said it would be like if we knew that there was a food that we thought caused cancer and we did a control group you people continue to eat that food in the same amounts. Hmm. You people eat more of that food. You would never do that. You could never get that through any sort of medical review board. They would say, well, we already have correlational research that shows this is bad. We don't want it. We can't cause harm, right? And she said the same would be true for a study like this. You couldn't do it. But if you look, uh, when you, Project Red is, the, is kind of the, the group that links together all of the educational technology companies. Uh, Red is redesigning and revolutionizing education. Revolution. Yeah, there four of their nine tips are about how to increase screen time in the class. And you have to use it every single day. The more you use it, the better. That's what that's what when Intel and Hewlett Packard studied, they found that the more Intel and Hewlett Packard use, the better. That's shocking. Uh, <laughs> but if you Look at what we're doing, the model of the next classroom. I mean, this is a real classroom. It's called rocket ship. And kids spend four to five hours a day in their learning cubes, learning, right? This is sickening. This is, this is you know, so counter to what we learned 60 years ago from Harry Harlow. Kids need interactions. Now, one of the things that we always, you know, when you leave a PD or PL or whatever it's called now, professional development, Something you can take, the, the hopefully one thing you can take away from this is that the most important thing you can do in your class is, is be you. You are the tool that you need. You don't need technology. You don't need tools. You need, the kids need you, all right? You need to be the, the present teacher that you want to be. And, and I'm sure most of us, that's why we got into the profession. Right. And, and if there is a way that technology that works to to do something that can't be done any other way, and we say, of course you use it, right? They, I, I, the example I give, the best part I'm really tired of hearing is, that, is when I was in college over at JNU, I took an astronomy class, and there was a, in the textbook, there was a star map, and the book was printed in Iowa. And so the star map was over Iowa. And so for like one night a year, if you happen to be in Iowa, it was an accurate star map, and you, you know, at night. You can say, well, that's ridiculous, right? So there was no point in really having that in the book. Um, but if you put Google Sky on your phone or on your tablet or whatever, it's free app, you can, during the day, point your, your phone up and it will tell you what's up there, even during the day or at night or whatever. You can look, you're walking home from a night class, point it up and you can see where all the constellations are and, and all, you know, everything that's going on in the sky. Really cool. That there's no way to do that with a paper star map. So it's a great use of technology. If you're teaching a, an astronomy class, I would assume that that would be something that you would use. There's no better way to do it than that. So that's a great use. Here's another example, collaboration. One of the great things about, um, I don't know, so this is they connect kids. We hear that all the time. We had a teacher teach us uh, world religions. And one day I'm walking by her classroom and pause and look in and she's having a, 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 a like a Zoom meeting or screencast or whatever. Skype. I'm like, is that Tony Blair? She was Zoom meeting with Tony Blair. Kids were all sitting there talking. That's like, that's unthinkable like 30 years ago. Um, that's great, that's wonderful. Why are you having kids collaborate with each other in a classroom that they're sitting next to each other on a Google Doc, right? The kid is writing something in a document and the kid sitting next to him is commenting on it. Why not just have the kid turn around and be like, comment to him? Like, <laughs> it doesn't make it now, it's not like, oh, it's, I'm typing it, it's the 21st century, right? In, in, in fact, if you think that's the equivalent, look at any conversation that's going on on Facebook. Do this, go to a YouTube video about anything and then look at the comments. Those aren't human beings commenting, right? Those are the worst things in the world. They're the worst people. Because you you say things online, let's say somebody's face. That's not communication. Communication is this. It's looking 
face to face, getting a reaction. It's hard. It's harder than typing and it's difficult. And that's why you hear that a lot. You know, it's so great technology. So what about the quiet kid who just doesn't want to talk? Let him tweet his response up here and you can see it. Well, how about you, you tell that kid, hey, talking and communicating is really important. So why don't you try it? Why don't you work on it? Work with the kid on how to do it better. Mm -hmm. Rather than giving them an escape. And so we want to end with kind of where we started, um, just kind of talking about this idea, these, these skills um, that I, I think are, are important, leadership, communication, focus, attention, white knowledge, race, and humility. Um, just kind of ending we're here with a discussion on it. What are, what are some good ways to do these things that, whether they involve technology or not, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you can think of a good way to use technology to do any of these. Um, are there any things that you're doing with technology that are that are particularly, you feel like hit these things? Examples that are um, better than the analog version, so to speak? Um, that's the, that question, by the way, better than the analog version, is the first question that we feel like, that we ask, and it's the first question I think we all have asked when, whenever we're told that we need to use technology, we need to have a screen, we need to have a, a, a device in the classroom. Okay, why is that better than the analog version? Why is a digital textbook better? Not as good as, why is it better? Because hopefully we're all on the same page and we want to do the best imaginable thing for our kids. Okay, well how is the digital, because we have almost exclusively digital textbooks. Um, we ask that, I mean, and you don't usually get a very good answer, but why, how's this better, how's this better for a kid? If you don't get a great answer for that, then maybe that's not the, the tool you ought to be using. Or at, least, at the very least, what it tells you is the person hasn't thought very deeply about why we're using it. Um, I think if they were honest and it, where we work, they would probably just say cost saving. I think it's cheaper um, to have a digital textbook than to have to every few years buy, uh, you know, hard copies. You know, it's not a storage problem and so on. Um, but it's got to be the best thing, right? And again, there are those things. Google Sky for teaching astronomy, great. Um, you mentioned earlier having kids uh, learning how to code. Um, you know, if you're going to teach computer science, you need a computer. Right? Um, but we have to think about purposeful, intentional use. Um, is there is there anything like do you do you see that, that in any way any of these that using technology, uh, using a screen or whatever would inhibit any of these? Do you find that your kids are communicating online in effective ways. How do you find your class discussions? Are you guys able to have, you know, some of you, you guys look professional and seasoned. Like, <laughs> That's, I, I, I take offense. <laughs> I'm going to be offended for them. <laughs> they look like they know what they're doing. Okay. Right, that's the next <laughs> like, have you noticed that diminishing ability to talk conversations like face to face if you have a class discussion are kids able to participate have you seen a change in the last five to ten years yes yes okay i think it's i've taught for 13 years and it's all been down <laughs> <laughs> okay what, when you say it's all been down here what do you mean uh, focus attention um, like you like you mentioned earlier with the cell phone notifications going off all the time. Yeah, it's it's frustrating to uh, keep their attention it's How do you how do you deal with that in your classroom? Well, uh, it's, it's easy to see when it happens So I make sure I call on their names mm -hmm. and tell them to put it away and I have to do it multiple times and I actually have to take the device up so and anytime we have an assessment they have to put the device mm -hmm. elsewhere and we'll area that they have right to separate themselves from so would you say that, like, do you, do you feel like it's, that that's a direct result of overuse of technology, or do, is, there, is there something else going on? Um, it's definitely, part of it is an overuse of technology. There are good things that technology can do for us, sure. you mentioned before. But it's, yeah, it's the overuse. I mean, they're so, and some of them are addicted to it. And that's the sad part of that is when they are addicted to it, they can't separate from it. Yeah. Um, I think in the last, and I think that's probably when we started seeing it, you mentioned the last five and 10 years, the cell phone, the smartphone uh, was 2007. Seven. June 29, 2007. 2007, okay, there you go. Um, and I think it was 2012 when it became, and I, I don't know how they measured market saturation among particular age groups, 
but I think it was 2012 when half of teenagers, I think that was the first time, was it 2012? Yeah. Um, when half of teenagers had them. And, and that's right around the time, it's seven years ago, that's right around the time we started to have these conversations. And, um, you know, again, we're not, you know, researchers in the sense of where we're actually going out and doing the studies, but when you read it, it's right, that is a very clear dividing line. Um, and so the, the, where we get dinged when we, when we get dinged by people, they say, well, you're talking about correlation, not causation. Okay, well, it's correlation. <laughs> it's certainly not helping, right? Well, we know that. I mean, and, and there's a there's there's a significant amount of research now coming out that says, yeah, it's probably causation. Um, in, the, in the beginning, you're just going to get the correlation because the numbers are they're too close together, and the sample sizes and the time periods are so small. Uh, but now we're starting to see some some studies come out about correlation. Yeah, and one of the things we'd say too is you can't get this without this. Kids aren't going to. Fall backwards into learning stuff. They, they, you have to have their attention. <laughs> so one of the things we encourage is, and this is hard as a teacher. You teach seniors and they're eighteen, but I finally, for the first time, had a little, a little shoe cubby where they put their little phone in, and it's a fight. The first day I forgot to tell them to do it. Not one kid did it. Right, like you have to stand there every single day because it's too much to ask for this to happen, which requires deep cognitive thought. If you don't have this, so these these are very much related. Um, do you have other questions for us? One right. thing I've noticed with middle school students is a lot of conflict between students is because of social media things that, that they smart. have said on social media to each other. And the other thing that's interesting is that kids believe if it was on that screen and somebody said they said such and such, they believe it. Isn't that, that's it? Really, is remarkable. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, they will certainly believe something they read online more than they believe if you look them right yeah. in the eye and tell them. Um, and so, I, and so that they often miss the second part of that, which is, okay, well, then when you post something online, people are going to believe it. You know, if it's something that's mean, well, that was really mean. <laughs> that, was, that, that person's really going to take that to heart. Well, maybe I am ugly, or maybe I, you know, I, you know, I do smell bad, or whatever it is. Um, and I, I think we that's one of our big jobs is getting them to see that that is... If I say something mean to you, I have to see you go, oh, that was, that was mean. And, th and that's, you know, and then, and then I go, oh, well, maybe I shouldn't say that because I don't like that feeling. But if I just type something mean about you, hmm, that's easy to do. Right? And then I can do that again and again and I never have to deal with, with that. So I think we have to, we do have to, like I was saying earlier, we're the adults and I think we have to remember that. We have, we have to rehumanize their lives, right? Like a digital existence is inferior to a real existence. So, you, so we have to rehumanize, you know, bring back that human empathy that they're lacking. These digital psychopathy, like they, they don't have empathy because they, they can say, you know, whatever they want and they don't have to see that other person's anguish when they say that mean thing, and, you know. I think it's important to know that the same vulnerabilities that were in existence 2,000 years ago are still present. Mm -hmm. It's just that the technology has amplified how we navigate those things. So Absolutely. A middle schooler feels that vulnerable sense of, do people like me? Am I connecting with others? And then they have that constant um, wrestle of being a first. And that, you know, when I was in a non-technological world in the 70s, I had the same vulnerabilities. Sure, so absolutely. Uh, and interestingly, just the other morning, I heard a student say, yeah, I had 200 likes on my, um, I forget it was an Instagram. And another, this was the part that got me. The other student said, good job. <laughs> and that just kind of made me sick, actually. Mm -hmm. And at some point, I, I need to move back to that student and talk to her. But, you know, that sense of you've accomplished something because 200 people said they like yeah, and, and and going back to something you said earlier too, the the issue is especially with with bullying, cyberbullying. It used to be you could avoid the bully, right? Now you can't, and it's with you all the time. It's it following. There's no ability to escape. Kids need a place to escape. They can't because it, it's with them in a virtual world that follows them everywhere. So you know, in our growing up, like you know, oh, that kid's a bully. I'm gonna stay away from him because he's gonna say something mean. Like you can't escape from that today. Like kids are confronted with this every single day and it's hard for them. Uh, last question for 
uh, what's your recommendation regarding phones and students in school in general? Like if you could, if you were designing a school, um, what, what would you do with, with cell phone use? In particular, I mean, you said the rule is, is it better than the animal? Right. Would you, do you think it's harmful that students are carrying them around in their pockets all day? Yeah. And would you, would you try to, you know, if you've got car clogs and you could, you can make a school yourself, what would you do? We would, we would say, one of the questions we get a lot is, well, what's the, um, how's a kid supposed to learn how to use technology appropriately if we don't teach them how to use technology appropriately? Appropriate use sometimes means not using it. And so uh, we would say it's a classroom is a place where a, a cell phone has no role. Uh, it's, it's not appropriate. It's, you, I mean, it, you know, if, if it's, a, if it's a truly an emergency, a parent can call the office. Um, and other than that, it just doesn't need to be there. Um, you're in church. You're at home eating dinner with your family. You're in a conversation with, with a loved one. That, none of those are places where a cell phone belongs. And, and we would certainly say that a, a classroom is... Always. See, there you're running into a slippery slope because now the kids got it. You know it's there, and you're and you're asking them to do the impossible, which is carry it around, feel it buzzing in their pocket during class, and then not look at it. That's, they're not going to pay attention to you. They're just going to be thinking, what's, what's happening? In an ideal world. Yeah, I would say. say I, in an ideal, yeah, absolutely. The problem you're going to run into, and I don't empathize any administrator on this one, but um, is the parents. Parents are going to be the biggest ones to push back. They're so afraid of being out of contact with their kids in case something happens, right? We went to a PTA meeting. We just saw a story a little bit ago. A PTA meeting where there was a fire alarm or the, the fire alarm went off in between classes, and they never practiced that. And there was actually a fire. It was actually a fire. Fire the girl. This is the mom relaying this. She's like, my daughter didn't know what to do, so she called me and said, you know, mom, nobody's telling me what to do. What should I do? And I had to tell her, I'm so glad I have my cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> right? And the parents are the ones who she back, right. and she was mad. She, I, if I'm that parent, I'm like. You need to learn how to cope. Walk outside. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know how to walk outside. You're a 16 year old in high school. You don't know how to walk outside and get some fire. I'm worried about you. Like, like, it's a pro it, it is a problem. It's it, and the parents are the biggest offenders. The parent, you know, you see, I'd, I'd see kids say, "Who touched your mom?" And they'd be like, "Yeah." And then I would look at it occasionally. Sure enough, they touched their mom all day long. They don't know how to cope as a result. So I would say yes, in an ideal world, um, is that likely to happen? I don't, I don't know. It's hard it's, to say. It's, yeah, it would be tough because the parent, I think the parents would be the one to really. You know, your job this evening is to help our parents. <laughs> I do. I do. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to tell that story. Um, and, and we'll tell, uh, it is, you know, I know that you're over time. And we know how painful that is. We're really sorry. Uh, but I, I will just tell you this last story, just in terms of parents wanting to get in touch with their kids. This is uh, just last year. I had a student at the end of class, probably 10 minutes left in class, normally very engaged, you know, talking to the student, and put his head down on his desk, which was unusual for him. And kids were packing up, class ended. Everybody laughed, and he was getting ready to leave. And I said, hey, what's going on? And he lifted his head up, and I could see that he'd been crying. And I said, what's going on? He said, nothing. And I said, come on, let's, you know, let me help you out. What's, what's going on here? And he said, I just got a text from my dad. My mom collapsed at work, and they're rushing her to the hospital. Did that message need to be conveyed uh, to the kid in that moment? On this, like that needed to come from. If the day, if, first of all, it's not like the kid can do anything right then. But second of all, if the dad needs to take a kid to the hospital, okay, come, absolutely, come to the school, pick up your kid. But tell an adult to go to the room and say, "Hey, I need to see so and so. Come out in the hall. Here's the situation, and we'll bring you outside." That can still happen, that the kid didn't need the cell phone. This kid went through this really horrible thing very publicly because um, you know, kids next to him could see that he'd hear that he was crying. And, like, uh, and that was, you know, that's not, because that was a real family emergency. The mom thankfully ended up fine. Um, that was a real emergency and it didn't really need the cell phone. In fact, I think the cell phone made it worse. So, I mean, I, I think we can, there's some common ground that we can, I think, all share. Uh, I can't tell you how much we appreciate your time. We've, we've right we'll, we'll hang out for a little while if anybody wants to talk to you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.